Welcome to today's Faith and Fashion, Collecting Arab Dress, Chronicling Multiple Faiths. I'm Rena Lewis, Professor of Cultural Studies at London College of Fashion, University of the Arts London, and I convene the Faith and Fashion Talks. It's probably a year since we last held an event, and I'm delighted to welcome you all today. I find it very hard to talk into the void of the screen right now when I know so many people joining us will have had a very difficult experience during the pandemic. I'm also aware that today we're speaking in May 2021 as lives are being lost, taken in Palestine and Israel and our hearts go out to all those directly affected and also to the many more who are touched by the conflict. In this context, I'm especially honored to be sharing the platform with Dr. Reem El Mutwali who founded the Zay Initiative in 2019 to collect and contextualize garments from the diverse populations of the Arab world. With over 30 years experience in art and cultural heritage, Dr. Reem has been building a collection of dress that tells a story of affinities and distinctions spanning multiple faith and secular traditions and histories. Through their scholarly activity and public events, the Zay's specialist team preserve the dress history of the Arab lands as a contribution to widening understanding of the interconnectedness of societies past and present. Garment histories tell stories of movement, of displacement, of achievement, and of course, of taste and trend. The Zay's deliberately inclusive approach to acquisitions and engagement is an important intervention into global critical fashion studies. I have to say, I'm particularly thrilled to be in conversation with Dr. Reem today, because to be honest, I can't believe I got lucky enough to know her and count her as a friend and colleague. I was in Saudi Arabia in spring 2017 with Jill D'Alessandro doing research for the Contemporary Muslim Fashions Exhibition scheduled for San Francisco Fine Arts Museum the following year, when one of our Saudi design contacts arrived at the hotel carrying, heaving, a precious copy of Reem's two-volume magnus opus, Sultani Traditions Renewed, a social and cultural history of women's dress in the United Arab Emirates 1966 to 2004. Now anyone working on the area will know this work was unparalleled in terms of weight, in terms of access to dress, it had access to dress belonging to the royal families and regional elite and because it provided an excellent social history on dressmaking and the sartorial impact of the region's rapid political, economic and social change. Ever since that brief glimpse, I've been a major fangirl of Reem's work. So you can imagine my pleasure today in opening a conversation about Arab fashion, history and society in the context of collecting and curating. Reem was born in Iraq and moved as a child to the United Arab Emirates, later studying for her first degree in fine art and interior design in the USA and completing her doctorate here in London at SOAS. Since working with the Cultural Foundation Abu Dhabi in the early 1980s, Reem has contributed to the establishment of cultural and arts institutions in the Emirates. She's advised on museum displays, led projects and convened public events. Her expertise on regional dress cultures and material histories is sought after by international cultural institutions and auction houses as well as private collectors. Reem also finds time to pursue her private practice in interior design and costume making, as well as contributing regularly to the Emirati and international press. Her Emirati and regional networks have expanded to benefit the Zay Initiative, brokering donations from around the Arab world and its diasporas, as well as items from neighboring communities that show transnational and intercommunal aesthetic influence and exchange. In collecting and preserving garment heritage, the Zay also disseminates specialist knowledge to the widest possible publics with an impressive set of exhibitions and artistic collaborations. Most recently and to great acclaim, the Zay has hosted a series of webinars which have built a loyal global audience. The webinars have showcased how collectors, researchers and creatives across the visual and literary arts have engaged with dress as a language for the expression of gendered, ethnic, religious, national and transnational identities. Scholars, students, designers and artists 
also benefit from the Zay's Digital Dictionary, an ambitious resource on dress and adornment that we'll be talking about more later. The next generation of researchers are also to be supported by the Zay's scholarship scheme. In a moment, I'll hand over to Dr. Reem for a short presentation about the Zay's collecting policy and their scholarly and community work. Then I get to indulge myself with some in-conversation follow-up before we hand over to you for questions and contributions. So please write your responses from now going forward into the chat box and we'll get through as many as we can. But first, over to Dr. Reem and the first slide, please, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Reina, for inviting me to this platform to meet your audience and introduce our work. Uh, you have summed it up so beautifully. I want to thank you for your support uh, to my team as my, and myself as well. And I would like to begin by giving the audience some background. I was born, as you said, in Iraq, but never lived there. I grew up in the United Arab Emirates, where my father was one of the advisors to the court that helped form the country in 1968 onwards, as he was appointed the economic advisor to the crown prince there, who is today the president of the UAE. So I grew up within this country and watched it become uh, so flourished. I, I went to boarding school in England and was planted to none other than Kansas in Midwest America for my bachelor's degree. And that's a whole other story we can talk about at another time. Uh, I then came back to the UK and did my master's and PhD at SOAS. I am a naturalized Christ, uh, Canadian with an American Kansan born daughter. I live now between Canada, UAE and the UK. So I have spent my whole life uh, trying to explain one culture to the other. Combined with my background and with my work field uh, in art, architecture, heritage, and history, I find myself indirectly at this junction. We can go to the next slide, to, which brings me to um, the Zay Initiative. Um, could we have the next slide, please? Uh, our name originates from Arabic term Zay. Now, say simply means the costume and general attire of certain country or era. We use the Arabic term because the initiative is concerned with the legacy of the Arab world. And I feel under the present circumstances, as you just highlighted in your opening statement, I should briefly explain what do we mean when we say the Arab world. By many estimates, there are 200, over 200 million Arabs worldwide. An Arab is a uh, cultural trait rather than a racial one. Not all Arabs are Muslims, nor all Muslims are Arabs. The Arab world is full of rich and diverse communities, ethnicities, religions, groups, and cultures, including Muslims, Christians, Jews, Yazidis, Kurds, Amazigh, Barbar, and other minorities. It is important to now note that differences do exist not only among countries, but within countries as well. And generally, anyone who adopts the Arabic language is typically called an Arab. Now, going back to the initiative, if I may have the next slide, please. Going back to the Zay initiative, it's a UK registered nonprofit organically growing out of contributions made by like-minded individuals seeking to empower their thoughts through knowledge. Though we are by no means an institution, I am happy to report that of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs adopted by all United Nations members in 2015, as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. The Zay Initiative is proud to be particularly aligned with four of these SDGs. As I said, the two terms Muslim and Arab are often misunderstood or as interchangeable, but they are not so. Islam is a faith, and by most estimates, about one fifth of humanity, six billion plus people, 
or approximately 1.6 billion are Muslims. In other words, a Muslim is a person or an individual that embraces the region of Islam, religion of Islam. They range from Indonesia, South Asia, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Africa, China, Australia, Western Europe, to Canada and the United States. Yet the two do not, they, that, I'm sorry, yet the two do intersect at many levels. And the Zay Initiative aims to shed light on these intersections, be it through the collection or the supporting platforms within the project. Now we are constantly seeking to uh, collaborate with individuals such as artists, designers, and on a creative level. And we also are seeking to work together with institutions on a collaborative level. Uh, I will name a few of those, such as the Shindaka Museum, which is a new museum in uh, part of the Dubai Culture Project, and it's due to be opened soon. We are working with the Smithsonian, and they have invited us very gratefully to participate in their yearly um, folkloric fa uh, fair, which takes, takes place uh, in the summer, as soon as COVID is um, seeked out. And the Aga Khan Museum in Canada as well, we are negotiating possible um, collaborations together. Now, Professor Reina spoke about um, our digital platform. And uh, as part of our community outreach, we created this unique, free and interactive global digital access to dress culture of the Arab world that is growing by the day as we populated by publishing ah. collection one article at a time. Yes, we've got the, the slides back. Wonderful. Thank you. If we may go to the next one. So the digital archive uh, provides high resolution visual depictions delineating each article. It details descriptive and historical records articulating every article. It also includes details of videos for key articles, and it paved the way for a dictionary on the terms on vestments and adornments. One can reach the digital archive through a menu on our website and choose the language, Arabic or English, by which to navigate. Once you are on the page, the information is connected to the dictionary through pop-up uh, bubbles sorry, uh, or links to related blogs, webinars, and institutions that deep dive into multiple aspects. I hope I gave you a general idea about our work, and I wonder if you would like to go now to our discussion parts, uh, Professor. I will, and thank you so much, Reem. I'm sorry that we lost your slides. We had one of those horrible technical glitches, no, um, but I think that we've made some progress. Thank you so much for that lovely presentation. We'll maybe revisit some of those slides and to our audience, thank you for your patience whilst we dealt with the problem. Um, Luke, could we get the first image for the presentation, please? Not the, okay, that's great. So. I want to start at the beginning with a first set of question points about object acquisition, if I may, Dr. Reem. We know that around the world and in the Middle East, most garments that are retained over time, that are preserved, that are not lost, tend to be elite dress rather than clothing of the non-elite, and also dress for special occasions rather than for everyday clothing. In the case of the Zay's collecting history, which items or types of items have been easiest to acquire and what's been hardest? I'm thinking both in terms of region and location as you expanded from the initial Emirati collection and also types of garments and apparel. We are constantly uh, striving to find examples of full outfits. This is our main objective at the moment uh, in order to represent every and each Arab country to ensure that at least one outfit of every country in the Arab world is researched and recorded. Now, the core of the collection is based on the UAE traditional dress. Uh, we have approximately 1,500 articles to date. Uh, about, uh, let's say, 60% of these articles are from the United Arab Emirates, which is 
um, an accomplishment in itself because this country grew very fast and everything became so disposable that so much of it has been lost uh, to time. Uh, now, 20% of our collection stems from Yemen, Syria, and Iraq. And these are countries where UNESCO has declared heritage to be in danger. And I feel that it has been our greatest challenge so far, but we have been able to collect from these countries in order to preserve their culture. We work closely with many collectors from the region, but also strive to meet individuals from tribes and areas within the countries as every one of those people have their own traditions and their own stories and narratives. Social media has, plays, has played a great role here as it connected us with a global audience, as you said, that is helping populate this collection. And going back to the tangible and intangible, as much as it is important to save the crafts, we also like to save the stories of the women and men who wore them and made them. Uh, and in due course, we hope to be able to save examples of certain crafts and to run courses to teach people these traditional crafts, to help sustain them. And we'll come back to that later as well when we talk about the dictionary, which is about, you know, the extent to which some knowledges are, are lost or are being lost. And part of the project is to retain that. Do you ever have to turn anything down that people offer you? Very, very, very good question. Are you allowed uh, to play? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, by all <laughs> means, uh, we are still, you know, we are still on the first steps of our mission. And every day we organically discover a new aspect that we need to include or add to our goals. Um, so connecting with our advisors who are truly icons with much longer and grounded experience in this area, like uh, the likes of Sitwidat Pawar or Shahira Mehrez, has helped us surmise the obstacles and the challenges they continue to face as we engage together to find solutions. And creating an advisory board is an accomplishment in itself as we are bringing together experts such as Alia Khan, head of the Islamic Fashion and Design Council, Dr. Jillian uh, Vogelsang, head of the Textile and Research Center, with collectors and researchers such as um, Marjorie Ransom, authors, uh, Sigrid Van Rood, Dr. Leila Al-Bassam from Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth, in an umbrella to engage in dialogues and hopefully reach mutual and plan, uh, mutual goals as well as plan fruitful outcomes. To answer your question in turn, if we turn anything down, I must say, yes, we do indeed. Uh, we need to be very selective in what we collect because we are still operating without any headquarters or a physical space. Uh, so it's very important that we uh, make sure that we create a collection that is representative of the area as best as we can. Having said that, some articles, uh, uh, how can I say, have their own weight uh, because the stories that come with them are unbelievable and we can't turn them away. And I think that that experience of having to delicately um, decline a donation, but also, or an acquisition opportunity, but also maintaining relationships is something that a lot of uh, curators and museum professionals, for example, in our audience will be well aware of. And in terms of stories, you've just led me perfectly onto my next conversation point. If we could have the next image, please, Luke, which is, in collecting garments, you are, of course, also collecting stories. Garment histories are personal and family histories. They tell the stories of community and society. And I know the Zay works really hard to complete a full profile for the garments. Um, when you're trying to get this data, this information, do you have to navigate delicacies uh, when you're talking to individuals or families? Do you ever get asked to keep some information private or under embargo for a period of time? How do you deal with that? Yes, I, I'm so glad you asked this question because we do face it a lot. Uh, you know, um, we are, I feel that we are breaking, slowly breaking cultural barriers. Uh, um, many of the people that donate to us 
come from different backgrounds uh, and perspectives. Some of them prefer to stay um, anonymous uh, due to social uh, concerns or, mm. or, or, or frameworks. Uh, for example, uh, some of them donate, let's say, a private article of clothing, like a survival, for example, and they would rather, they, they are too shy to say that this- I'm gonna interrupt you to explain what that is for anyone who doesn't know. Like an underpants. Yes, sometimes the article itself is a bit private and it's very difficult for people to accept to put their names on it. So mm. they, we record the name, we record the source, but we do not uh, post it on our uh, website. Another social restraint is the fact that um, many of these articles come from women. And in Arab culture, usually uh, the name of a woman is not really, it's not something that people uh, like to divulge. So when, when they say, for example, this belongs to this person, they'd rather give us the name, uh, uh, we say um so-and-so, meaning the mother or, of so-and-so, or the father of so-and-so. So they, so they give us the name of their children or the, 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 uh, the name by which they are more known rather than their own name. So we need to make sure we record their original name and yet keep that uh, only publicized, the one that they prefer to be out there. Another uh, point is the fact that uh, we meet uh, many um, religious doctrines. For example, Islamic teaching favors that when you give something, because when they are donating, it's a form of a waqf, which is, uh, how do you say it, uh, a fund, an Islamic fund, whereby you give something away for the benefit of others. And usually hmm. when you- Philanthropy and charity. Yes. So, uh, so when they are giving something out, in, in Islamic teaching, you are always taught that you always should not be speaking about it in order for you not to lose the charitable benefit of giving, which we call hasana, you know? And another issue is, for example, um, politically, sometimes some of these garments, especially the very um, elaborate ones, they are given as a khila, which I know you understand what it is, but it's also an honorific, a uh, gift that is given from somebody of high stature who might have been very important politically at a specific time in the Arab world. And today people are frowned by the fact that you mentioned that person or that uh, era. So what we do again, we, we, we record it, but we do not divulge the information. And this created a form of uh, um, uh, confidence between us and the donors and uh, to the extent that sometimes even when we publish an image and especially images from uh, taken by various visitors or travelers to the area in the early part of last century. So they've got images of young children, for example, and these children have become adults. Many of them are women. These women recognize themselves when we publish the images and they come back and tell us we are, I, this is me. My name is so and so, and sometimes they are. I'm lucky enough that they send me their photo of today as an adult, but they request that we do not publish publish it because of the social norms of the at present moment. So what we do is we save it and we respect what they they are asking us for. We keep it on record, and maybe in future it will be approved or it will be accepted as a social norm. Mm -hmm. We can put them, but at least we identify these people and we recorded the names and whereabouts. This is so fascinating because all of this, I mean, some of the information is in a way sort of kind of peripheral, but culturally recognizable and understandable if you have that cultural competency. So about philanthropy and charitable donations, and also depending on your historical um, period, your, your knowledge of, of regional history, the idea of, clothing as a form of gift exchange and the obligations that are involved in that and so what it means to then transfer that somewhere else and whether the names are public domain or are redacted um, but then also the different personal and cultural sensitivities about what's on display which we could think about in other contexts but in this particular context there's a layer of information that you have to sort of keep redacted whilst also of course as the archivists you're obligation is also to future scholarship and future users of your collection, which is there may come a time when 
this information needs to be made available. And I know that in my own research and certainly with many of my um, PhD students and our MA students doing research, that question of how do you get around those delicacies? How can we sometimes harness digital technology so that you can pixelate out someone's face or any other distinguishing features like jewelry so that you can sometimes show some part of an image? It's an ever-changing field. And I think it's so fascinating to think about you know, something that you gathered, let's say 10 years ago versus something that you're able to archive now, how we're able to do those things differently. But it's so, um, it's so delicate and it's so difficult. And I think when it comes to telling dress stories, I was interviewed for a, um, an oral history project once about clothing and presentation. And it was such a salutary experience. I always say to my students, you know, let someone interview you, let someone take you through your qualitative research interview questions, because until you've told your story and seen, seen the transcript and thought, oh no, I didn't want to talk about my mum like that, or my cousin didn't really hate that dress the way I said it. So it's that fine nuance, which for us as researchers, for you as curators and archivists is so important. Um, and people want to know so much. So now we go, please Luke, to the next image and we come on to audiences because the initiative has several overlapping audiences, local viewers and visitors who are able to see your offline exhibits and events, some examples on screen here, online users of the archive, which we should also say of course is in Arabic and English, which is in itself a major endeavor and online audiences for your wonderful webinars. You. I know are aware of your different audiences and user groups and stakeholders to use that dreadful phrase. How has this changed over time? Are you seeing differences? And does that change the way that you sort of address your different users and audiences? Yes, very much so. We, in general, we aim to attract individuals or we tend to attract individuals who are intellectually curious about the Arab world in order to spread knowledge and deepen or broaden their understanding of the region. Now, taking an account of technology and globalization, coupled with the present situation as cultural travel is limited due to the pandemic, this has helped us grow our global audience and allowed us a much greater outreach. Having said that, we see variances depending on each platform. So if I was to categorize it, I would say those who follow us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter, they tend to, to look for, a more, for more general information, perhaps nostalgic ones at time, or look to catch a glimpse of the Arab world or Arab culture as a whole. And they are very much attracted to the narratives uh, that are embodied within them. While more focused audiences of experts, academics, and creative one, uh, minds, uh, as well as design-oriented individuals, want to deep dive into the topics and tend to follow our webinars, our blogs, and become involved with us as friends of the ZEI initiative. So we have different audiences that are coming in due to these platforms. Uh, and the, the time is shrinking because in one day you meet so many people. I've become friends with a, a tremendous amount of men and women who contact us and come across through the social media aspect and eventually become contributors to our blog or part of our uh, webinar series or uh, you know, work on a specific project for us. Uh, designers, they work on uh, producing artifacts uh, using our you know, data and the background information that they can surmise through the workshop. Uh, students, uh, in, uh, such as those that come across in your field uh, from, from all over the world, they contact us and, and they, I, I'm, I'm so happy to find some, some people have been following us for over seven months and researching the information that we are putting on the website. So it's, it's, it's wonderful to see that we are making an impact as we go along. I think you're making a tremendous impact and one of the, um, I can't say positive side effects of the pandemic because nothing overrides what's happened and is happening to people, but one of the things that we've been able to do is become more accustomed to this type of online webinar interaction. Also sometimes made, you know, people don't have to rearrange their day to get into London College of Fashion at Oxford Circus at two o'clock or 5 p.m. We can have speakers from all over the world in the digital room at the same time. 
Um, and certainly researchers and students have become suddenly so much more uh, competent with digital online resources, even those that weren't necessarily so much before. And I think the demand for what you have, you know, is going to keep expanding. And I know you have an excellent team uh, within the Zay staff team, as well as your advisors who are working on so many different components of this. Sometimes the problem is, is managing the demand and working out what to focus on first. I want to widen the picture a little bit now with the next slide, please, Luke, and think about the cultural politics of, of Arab dress. Um, in relation to cultural politics, it seems to me that you and the Zay team are simultaneously intervening in local cultural politics and dealing with international attitudes to Arabs and the Arab world and Arab cultures. Your object narratives reveal the richness of diasporic and transnational relations without losing focus on the history of distinctive aesthetic traditions and their role in building forms of identity, tribal, regional, religious, secular, national and transnational. This is slightly back to the question about audience, but it's also thinking about the cultural politics. So on one hand, I imagine we've got this um, Western Orientalist image here because those of us that work on uh, dress from the Middle East, North Africa region will know that very often uh, visual resources are Western pictorial renditions. It is an important part of the um, historical visual archive that we need to draw on. So I'm guessing on one hand, you still have to challenge Orientalist stereotypes, in particular that Arab women are hidden, oppressed and uniquely subordinated, or maybe you're gonna tell me that public understanding has moved on on this. And then also, are there changing internal concerns about narratives of national and cultural identity? So both external presumptions and internal dialogues. Yes, uh, you are very right, uh, Professor. We believe uh, in empowering through knowledge. So our ultimate goal is to build global cross-cultural dialogues to highlight our shared humanity, in addition to empowering regional individuals and sustaining traditional crafts to inspire these creative minds. Now, we seem to be tackling both through an external and an internal lens, just as you just said. This is particularly important as we are speaking today uh, under the present circum geopolitical circumstances. So there is not one particular way in which to express notions or perhaps show different sports. And, and uh, I always like to make a statement here and, share, and say that um, our role at the Zay Initiative is by collecting and preserving and documentation, documenting cultural heritage, uh, we are, presenting in, on, in our own constructive way, uh, support and empowerment through knowledge. Now, um, we, we constantly have to balance our audience or our responses to our audiences by providing the information for them uh, that help them on, um, have a clearer uh, view of what they are looking at. Now, um, when I talk about internal, we seem to be engaged on many levels, especially through our webinars and blogs with Arabs within the Arab world and those who are in the diaspora. Each of them looking at issues from their own lens and individual rather than collective experience. This is why it is very important to support each article of clothing that we collect with the narrative of the person who donates it when possible to allow for a balanced representation and recording. So we are, personally, I think the, uh, the images that you just spoke about of Orientalism, although they carry their own perspectives, uh, they still are very helpful for us to identify the objects, to understand how they were used, to understand how they came about, look at the variances through them. They are, I think it is very important. Uh, Personally, I believe it is us who decide. It is the person who can decide how to use the material that is provided. So when you're looking at a painting, I think you can make your own decision whether this is something that is truly representational or it is something that is used for other purposes. But one, we, one can make, can always find um, 
the positive may be out of the negative. And this is part of the role that I see the Zay Initiative is, is trying to uh, work with. And I think that's a really important point right now, especially when in response to Black Lives Matter and related campaigns against racism and campaigns for social justice, our students and our faculty, as indeed researchers and students around the world, are very focused on decentering uh, the curriculum, moving away from a normative idea of, of Western cultures as definitive of fashion and everything else as somehow uh, not fashion or tradition and so on, but also in particular to the point of using historical sources that are themselves problematic. And obviously there are some historical sources that are too painful or too violent and we might not want to use them or only in very certain circumstances. And then others like the Orientalist visual canon where we have such a wealth of scholarship now that we can use them. And then of course our understanding of those images is augmented and changed by the detailed dress work, textile and dress histories that your research and the research of others, many of whom are here with us today, are providing on how we then can look at, at those images. And that's not just about are they true or false, but what do they tell us? What do they tell us about then and about now? Um, we're on to the next image, please. And again, you have linked us beautifully, which is about research and scholarship. Um, You've been building your digital content. This is a really huge project. I'd like to say just a little bit more um, about your ambitions for this work. And this is one of the images that we didn't get to show earlier, I think, as well. You're compiling a dictionary, a lexicon of garment definitions and also of textile techniques. Um, I know as well that the same garment has different names across the region, that small differences in cut, textile and embellishment can be hugely significant. So whilst you talk us through how you do what you do, could we also think about how much of this knowledge has been lost or is in danger of being lost uh, and whether things are known in the region or more broadly or sometimes just in very small areas or within particular communities? So how do you do what you do with your massive online project? Oh, you touched upon a point that is very important and very um, challenging. Uh, you know, there, there are so many layers to what you have just mentioned, and among our team, we are in a constant de debate uh, as to um, how to best navigate through all of this. Um, there is so much that's being lost. First of all, the Arab world, as I said, is a huge area. And it has variances, whether it is dialectically or even stylized, style-wise. Uh, and the, everything is so interwoven that sometimes uh, there are multiple layers to everything that you are seeing. At the, at the same time, a lot of the um, academic work that has been done on the subject is Western-oriented, as you said. And it is the West looking at the East, uh, you know, from that perspective. And again, as respectful as I am for that, because we, if it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have had the information to work with anyways. But it is very important to navigate through it in a sensitive way so that we can uh, come out with an outcome that is comfortable to, to the region as, and, and gives credit to those who have worked on it before and have come before us. So um, the topic of the, the issue exactly of the, uh, of the words and terminology and the dictionary came about because when we started recording, what you would call a thobe somewhere, is, or, which is an overgarment, can be called tobe in another place. And because it is being written by non-Arabs, it's very easy for a person to think that they are two different articles of clothing when they are just one. And sometimes it is the same terminology that is used, but they are two different articles because the term tob itself can mean fabric, you know, in Arabic language. So it's very confusing and it got us into so many arguments as a team between us, which is very good in a way because at least it, it helps us start to understand and find um, it, it's, 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 it's all an experience, learned experience as we go. 
And um, we have our lead researcher, Jackie, is presently working on a blog to discuss all of this, to put it in context, to put it down, so we can have a debate about it and, and have people coming in and read. And I really would like to invite everyone to read that blog once we have it out there and give us their feedback, because it's through this that we, were, we, we learn and develop uh, the, the more accurate narrative that everybody is seeking. Another aspect is social media. Having social media around nowadays has been very helpful because through social media, we can introduce a term or introduce a fact and ask people to respond to it. And you have global response coming in, whether you are living in the area, whether you are an Arab outside the area, whether you are non-Arab and lived in the Arab world and have your own experience of using that term or that article of clothing. So it sort of shrunk time for us because in one day or one week, what used to take us years as field work has been condensed and it's giving us results very quickly. And I always recommend and speak about this when I am talking to institutions like, such as yours because young uh, researchers can find a wealth of information uh, through our Instagram accounts and the responses, you know, the reams of, uh, of information that comes into that. I think it's going to form the basis for so many PhD uh, theses in the future because it's being recorded there very organically and very naturally. And somebody needs to go back and look into them and use them and, 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 and help put them there. So we go into the details. We even I'm even trying to find how we can uh, record how it is pronounced from one person to the other, you know? Uh, it, it's, it's very complex. And sometimes I think, what did I get myself into really? <laughs> well, we're gonna get ourselves in a moment into questions because I think it is a live field. It is a movable feast. And, you know, these terms change over time and they will continue to change in our lifetime in a way all classificatory projects, dictionaries, genealogies, lexicons, are a, a sort of a, a fictitious attempt to try and fix meaning, which we know we never can entirely do. So the advantage now is you can keep it mobile, which is wonderful. Um, we're gonna skip our last slide because I want to leave some time for conversation um, from the audience, if that's okay. And I'm going to uh, start with a question. Um, A question from uh, Louise Landman, who says, you mentioned that you're working towards four particular SDGs. Uh, I, my mind has gone blank. Tell me what SDG stands for. Uh, um, so <laughs> let me, I, I, I know how the, the abbreviation. Both gone blank. Anyway, um, so could you elaborate how you're doing that? So this is in relation also to the, to the UN uh, charter, isn't it? Yes, they are called SDG goals, which are social... Um, uh, and anyways, don't I don't worry know about the it. words, but we've got, there are four All of friends. them uh, that uh, pertain to, to our work. One is education. Uh, the other one is um, gender equality. Uh, third one is uh, cultural um, uh, intercon interconnection or exchange. And uh, of course, spreading peace, uh, sp spreading harmony among people with knowledge, when you, when you um, empower people, you can empower people by getting to, when, when they learn more about a, a culture and a society, they see the, the similarities and, and, and the human traits that we all share. So if these are the four perspectives that we work with. Um, thank you. And I have another question from Rowan Macri, who, Mackey, who's a student here with us doing her PhD at LCF, who says, how do you deal with the often heterogeneous, diverse cultural narratives within states? So, for example, in some parts of the Gulf, Sunni, Shia, and Gulf citizens of Persian origin have historical variations in dress, but the state often tries to represent one homogenous heritage, so a, a narrative with national heritage that unifies everybody within one style. Have you run into these into situations where the nuance is visible, and how do you deal with it? We run through this every time. And before I address that, SDG stands for Sustainable Development Goals, just so that we have that one. We're on top of it. 
I found it okay. But yes, this is this is very much part of our everyday work. Um, and the slide we showed as we were speaking actually was uh, the dress from uh, southern uh, Persia, which has a lot of our many indigenous people that are from Arab origin. They even speak Arabic. They they very much relate to the Arab world. Uh, so in my opinion, I think the Arab world in itself does not exist in a vacuum. And it has always been uh, um, a cross point from west, east to west and uh, the other way around. And it had many influences. We have Ottoman influences. We have Mughal influences. We continue to have people who even create these articles of clothing that are not Arabs themselves. Uh, and of course, as you would know, in the Arab world, you have uh, various ethnicities that were very well known for their crafts. I, I know the, the, the Jewish community in Yemen, for example, are very much known for their work in silver and, and uh, telly work, which is the silver embroidery work on clothing. So I don't think we need to, um, um, how can I say? Uh, diminish the, the, the contributions that are made by every different, by different ethnicities that are in, within the Arab world. I believe this is what weaves it into what it is. We will always have er periods of time where things flare up and, and arguments take place. But at the end of the day, they've existed long before our time and they will continue to exist past our time. So the key issue is to make sure that when we are documenting that article of clothing, depending on who has donated it to us, we are writing their narrative. And we are also introducing the historic background behind that article of clothing. Therefore, we are giving the audience um, the choice to make their own decision. We are not here to dictate any specific, uh, and actually this is why we established this uh, initiative outside the Arab world, because we wanted it to be completely independent and to be able to voice the, vo the, the, the notions and uh, the narratives of all those who are living within the Arab world at any period of time. Just to clarify that, when you say you established it outside the Arab world, you mean that it's registered as a charity in within the UK? UK? Yes. So in other words, having a UK jurisdiction for yourself sort of as an entity, as an enterprise was an important yes. way to go. Yes, I wanted it to be uh, grounded. I wanted it to be established in a place where it can continue, uh, uh, where there is a tradition for this kind of work. Uh, and it, it will give it the um, possibilities that might hinder it in any other place. And it also will give it the objectivity to be able to represent most of the Arab world or all of the Arab world within time and uh, their, their, their backgrounds. Uh, look at Iraq. You have, you have uh, um, it is the land, you know, the, the, the land of Mesopotamia. The history is so rich. Uh, where do you start? Which, which article of clothing represents Iraq? It is impossible to identify just one. There are so many ethnicities, so many religions that passed through that land. And it is very important for us to make a record of all of those. Again, I believe in humanity, in a shared humanity. And I think what um, Rowan's question and your response illustrates is that, you know, all history is, it's never neutral, it's always ideological, it's always partial and positioned. And as an organization, you've registered in the UK for a sort of logistical and political reasons. And also you are deeply immersed and grounded in the Emirates and in the region and then internationally in a set of relations and affiliations and loyalties. And in a way, the delicacy of the, how can I put this? The work that you do that the Zay Initiative does makes manifest the delicacies and the lines of um, support, patronage, affiliation, disaffiliation, the points of tension that are inherent in all projects of this ilk. It's just that in some, um, it might appear not to be the case because it's part of a more normatively established history or of a Western couture house, for example. And we can ask those same questions of all other forms of collecting and all other curatorial and archiving activities. 
this type of project, I think, makes that manifest. And I think that for us as researchers, as also for uh, curators and museum professionals, it's really helpful sometimes as well to be reminded of that sort of checklist um, of questions that we could all have. Now, um, I'm conscious of time and we have a number of um, excellent questions. I'll get through as many as that we can. Um, question from uh, Lena Malokotas Liedman, who's worked with us on the modest fashion area for many years. She says, Dr. Reem, you have so elegantly described your international and cosmopolitan background. What and in what concrete ways do you think dress can contribute to cosmopolitanism and to interfaith relations between different faith and ethnicities. So um, how does dress play into cosmopolitanism and interfaith and intercommunity connections? And she says, thank you for sharing with us such an inspiring project. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for listening, taking the time to listen to me. Uh, um, you know, uh, I think dress is, an, an, is a wonderful medium from which um, we all share. Uh, we all wake up in the morning and decide on what we want to wear. So it's an experience that we all have and it relates to people. It's a beautiful gateway to open into cultures, into the very various uh, backgrounds and um, um, ethnicities. And definitely it plays a, a big role in our, how can I say, collective future because I think so much is changing um, through globalization we are sort of becoming one and the same somehow because of the reoccurring images that you see and the way every, you know, let's say, uh, uh, how can I, um, celebrities dress and so on and so forth. And we are losing these special touches that we have as uh, individuals, individuals in different areas of the world. Yet at the same time, there are certain threads that uh, uh, enhance connectivity, uh, shared uh, humanity and so on and so forth. So definitely I believe that, 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 and this is why we chose it because it's a wonderful medium that crosses between culture, history, politics, religion, uh, craftsmanship, economics, um, individuality, design and, and future, I suppose. And I think when we talk about cosmopolitanism and movement, we're also thinking about movement that's voluntary or involuntary. Uh, that's happening in different circumstances where possessions can be retained or possessions are lost. And I know that um, we have a question from Joanna about um, other curatorial trends and developments, um, particularly in, in the region. Are there other organizations involved in similar sort of projects? And I'm going to add into that my question as well, which is in a context where there's been rapid economic change, in, in the Gulf countries and in parts of the Middle East and North Africa, then also do we see a different form of sort of nostalgic investment in the recent past as well, the sense of things disappearing and needing to be treasured. So do, is your work connected to other similar work in the area? Definitely, I, I, I see the work that we are doing is a, a celebration of the work that has come before us. There are many women and I named a few of them who have worked in this area. Uh, Iraq, for example, used to have the house of Iraqi fashion and they, were, they dealt for many years when the whole area didn't speak about this, but in Iraq, they started this and worked on it from the early seventies uh, um, and it developed and, and, and they researched all of this through, the, in the, through their own lens. You have Widat Qawar working in, in, uh, in Jordan. You have Shahira working in Egypt. You have many scholars in uh, North Africa that are working on this. You have in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf region, which is, a, uh, um, it is in the limelight now because of their you know, economic as well as uh, prosperous lifestyle that, uh, that is existing within this period of time in this area, geographical area. So you have Leila al Bassam, you have Mansujat, which is a wonderful organization, in, and we are we collaborate together all the time, uh, and 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 consult on many many issues. There are, of course, uh, many entities that are working on this, but they are all a sort of individual efforts that are taking place, like ours, uh, uh, initiated by concerned individuals who are trying to protect culture for future generations. And you touched upon a very important element, the diaspora. Many of these Arabs are no longer in one area of the world due to, due to the war 
war-torn countries that are uh, uh, in within the area and they are dispersed everywhere there are generations that are growing up outside these countries who are interested in getting to know themselves their background their identities uh, i i believe we can present to them uh, as as accurate as possible uh, a portrait from which they can take and interpret and use it to assimilate themselves within the cultures that they are living Humans did this before us, and they will continue to do it after us, whether this area of the world or in another area of the world. And it remains also, as you say, um, it remains a question also of funding, and also um, a major. Issue. I mean, we know that arts institutions, certainly in this country and in many others, are facing you know cuts to their funding and having to make very difficult decisions. And again. It is not surprising that a lot of this work is coming from um, individuals so that we need to see an increase. How can I put this? We need, a, we need to sort of, the work needs to gain critical mass so that it can get funding from donors, from institutions, so that it becomes a valid and validated object of study an area of specialism. Our next generation of students and early career professionals need to have roles, allow them to build on this as a specialism within fashion curation, within museum work, within design history, as a central part of the global story. And I think that's um, one of the important We've got a couple of minutes left. I'm gonna to go to one more question, but you can only answer it for about 40 seconds. Um, this is from Nada Dahab, who says, Dr. Reen, so informative and valuable. Thank you so very much for paving the way. Um, as an Arab British tutor, this is priceless. As an Alexandrian woman, I feel that we've lost the connection with our traditional dress and costume. Is there any way to reintroduce it to the younger generation in a way that they can potentially mix tradition and modernity and keep that connection? 30 seconds. Yes, it is, it is very much so. And that is the core of the work that we are doing at this age, because by having the information there, the background information that can ground uh, future designers, future creative uh, individuals, then they can have the tools from which they can build upon in order to reintroduce those crafts and those ideas into whatever they are creating for that moment. That's where the sustainability happens. It's not by cutting and pasting. It's by understanding the background, understanding where they come from. What are the symbols? What are the, uh, the materials that they require? If it is available for them and they are grounded with it, then they can make the, the how can I say, informed decisions for much better solutions in the future. And I should also say, and I'm sorry I only gave you such a short time, of course, that a lot of your work with, is working with creatives and designers and artists and photographers who are spinning on these ideas and creating new styles and objects and so on. So that gives you, as Nada uh, Dahab asks, the, content, the mix between tradition and modernity. Yes. I'm afraid that for those of you who posted questions that we didn't have time to answer, I'm really very sorry about that. Um, we will be posting the podcast of this and we'll let you know when that happens. I am going to close now with my happy privilege of thanking the many colleagues and friends that bring this event together. At the Zay Initiative, I want to thank especially the wonderful Emma Farmer and Catherine Beebe, who've gone above and beyond so often to help us sort out content and comms for remote delivery. Closer to home, the brilliant LCF events team, as ever, pull out all the stops to make this event run smoothly online. So a big shout out to Luke Saville, our event manager, and our marvellous head of external relations, Rebecca Monroe and her team. And thanks also to our research assistant, Vanessa Pope, who's also been running interference behind the scenes. Most of all, I thank our wonderful guest, Dr. Reem El Mutali. Reem, You've been a valued research interlocutor for some time now, and I'm so happy that we've managed to create this opportunity for conversation. There is clearly much more that we could say and that our audience could say, so we shall have to arrange future opportunities. We thank you, our audience, for joining us and for your contributions to the discussion. 
as I say, we'll let you know when the podcast of today's event goes live on our webpage. We'll also let you know so that you can subscribe to get notified of future faith and fashion events. And also we'll send you links to join up to hear more about events and activities from the wonderful Zay Initiative. Um, I have learned from Luke that once I sign off, the screen goes suddenly blank. So let me conclude with many thanks to everyone on screen and behind the screen, wishing you all well and stay safe. And Luke, we are over and out. <laughs>